Happy New Year, Aspire listeners. I'm so excited about the episode today as I have an opportunity to speak with Dr. Frank Radowski and Michelle Rispo-Hill, two authors of a brand new book called Fired Up Teachership. As we all know, education is a difficult field, and many teachers don't continue after their third year in the classroom. And so this week, we're talking about several things for not only new teachers, but supporting veteran educators. That way, everyone is able to have a passionate and long career. We're also going to discuss positive school culture, how to help within this teacher shortage, and ways our leaders can help all educators. Welcome back, everyone, to Aspire, the Leadership Development Podcast, where we will be discussing the visions, inspirations, and experiences from top educational leaders. My name is Joshua Stamper, and you can connect with me on Twitter or on Instagram at Joshua double underscore Stamper. Michelle and Frank, thank you so much for being on the Aspire Podcast. Thanks for having us. I'm so excited to have both of you on. You both have a book that you just put out, and I'm so excited to learn more about that piece of literature. But before we begin, I would absolutely enjoy hearing about your educational and leadership journey. And Frank, if you wouldn't mind going first, and then we'll have Michelle share about her educational journey. Well, we talk a little bit about this in the book, and our journeys to get where we are now have been a lot different. Uh, Mine, I've never taken a straight line to anything that I've done in my career, personal or or professional, but I didn't wake up in eighth grade and say, hey, I want to be a teacher. Actually, I wanted to be the Pope in eighth grade, but found out that I had to do all these other things first. So I I told Sister Marie Stevens, I'm out, you know, but um, still didn't wake up wanting to become a teacher, actually became a professional magician out of the University of San Francisco, was even chained up, handcuffed, nailed in a box and thrown in a river on purpose. And then, yes, that ended up being my journey towards education because I opened up a magic shop on the Wildwood Boardwalk in southern New Jersey, and they shut off my water on October 1st uh, because that's when our block shut down anyway on the boardwalk. So I decided to start substitute teaching. And when I did, that's when I found my calling. That's when I knew that's what I was supposed to do. I still do magic. I still love magic. That's one of my passions, but education is my calling. So I ended up uh, becoming a substitute teacher. And from that, I had many conversations with educators and and a principal that said, this is this is what you need to do. You really need to take a look at becoming a, a, a certified teacher. So that's that's the path that I that I chose and how I ended up getting there and then eventually into administrator. But the leadership component for me was never a position. It was never, I have to be a VP or a principal in order to be a leader, but it was always a common sense thing to me that once I stepped in that classroom, that I needed to accept my role as a leader and I need, needed to create more leaders around me, uh, mainly uh, the, the students, not just the colleagues. So that's uh, a roundabout way of leadership and and education for me. What about you, Michelle? Well, I'd like to say that in the book, I I point to the fact that I just loved kids. I mean, I I probably jokingly made any object that you could find in a blanket, a baby and took care of it and then put it in a a school chair and taught to it. Um, I did toy with the idea of law for a little while, but then I, I had a strong calling to go back to become a special education teacher because I saw that so many students that struggled weren't getting the kind of help that they want, that, that they needed. So I went back, um, you know, I went into college and, and became a teacher. And then I eventually went back and I got my certification to teach Spanish, which is a real passion of mine. And so, um, and then from there, I was, you know, prompted by a administrator, like uh, he basically said, have you ever thought about being an administrator? And I said, mm, I, I don't know. And by the end of the day, he had someone deliver an endorsement letter that I had to take to Wilmington <laughs> to get my certification to be a school leader. So I just think I was different than Frank in that I think it was always in me and I didn't take a really you know, strange path to get there. I, once I zeroed in on it, I went after it. And then I just kept building on my pedagogy and what else I could do to make sure that I was creating change for students. So Michelle, did you go into administration? 
So now I am, I call it a quasi administrative. I am district leadership, but I don't have any supervisory. My role now is a strategic marketing and admissions coordinator for a, a county Votex school here. So we recruit students because they come from 40 municipalities. So I love it. It's, it's definitely, I stepped out of the classroom, but I still love what I do. I do professional development for them. I'm the equity specialist for the two schools between the district. Um, and then on top of it, I, I do all the admissions work and, and the marketing for the district. So it's using the gifts that I have differently, but I'm still in the buildings almost every day. I love getting into classrooms and seeing where the magic happens. So it's been, it's been a different ride, you know, definitely a different ride. And like Frank, I was never about a title. It was never about, you know, I have to get to this position to have that title. I would just want to be where my gifts can be used for the greater good. That's so important. I think you both said it brilliantly as far as making an impact no matter where you are with students, with families, and with with teachers. So I know that the two of you worked in the same district, if, if I'm not mistaken, and I know that you're both passionate about school culture. So with your experience in, in the building together, what were some of the items that really worked for your building and increased the school culture um, to make sure that your students were successful? Well, Frank wants to point out that we worked for the same district, but not at the same time. <laughs> so we, we know a lot of the same people and we were just there at different times, but it, it definitely had a, a culture that we both really, I think, enjoyed in terms of what school culture should be. So I'll let him talk about that a little bit. There's a huge connection for me between culture, positive culture and positive leadership. It's synonymous as far as, as I'm concerned. And the big factor for me was building those relationships, especially with uh, the students. Again, giving those students some opportunities that they normally wouldn't have. The first class that I taught was accounting. I know, it. Don't, don't get all excited. I know when you hear that word, you're just jumping out of your chairs. But one of the reasons I got the job is because at the University of San Francisco, I had a few computer classes. I actually had a basic programming and data processing using key punch cards. So boom, I was hired to bring in the first computer lab in the business department. But one of the things uh, that I wanted to do, and like you see these, these students that don't play football, you see these students that don't have a club. Well, we created a group of students called the Accounting Maniacs. And uh, I was just reflecting on that this week because it was around Thanksgiving time that we would have our own fundraisers um, uh, raised enough money to buy a pallet of frozen turkeys for people in the community. And that was kind of a tying servant leadership together with the leadership capacity that you didn't think you had, but now you're looking at it differently. And even though we don't have a lot, there are people that have less than us. So giving those students opportunity and building those relationships were some of the biggest factors that kind of catapulted the idea of leadership, not only in me, but in in those young people. And that's when you have to really start. So carry that forward. When I actually became a principal, we started with 10 year olds. I was at the middle school and that was one of the goals is to bring these theories, bring these concepts, bring these ideas, bring these different ways of looking at yourself as soon as we can. And that's what we did. So that kind of brought everything full circle. What about you, Michelle? What do you remember of your district that really helped with school culture? Well, Frank hit the nail on the head when we talk about relationships, and, and it comes down to relationships with everybody. doesn't matter whether it's the students, which is, is really an important relationship, but also for the administrators to have a positive relationship with their staff members, their colleagues, you know, staff members to have relationships with their colleagues. It all comes down to relationships, honor, dignity, respect all day, every day. And that was one thing that, that really was present. When, when I worked in, in the classroom that I never felt as though an administrator was up here and I was, you know, below them. I felt like we were on the same team and could go to them and, and say, hey, I have an idea. Or how about if we think about doing this or these students need that? 
fortunately, I worked for some amazing administrators that just said, come on in, door is open, let's see what we can do. Today, it was really funny. I was driving to work and I was thinking, I was listening to a Brene Brown uh, podcast who I absolutely love. And she said something today that just moved me in a way that talked about school culture. And she said, the one question you should ask your staff today is what does support from me look like for you? That was just like, talk about culture. Instead of telling people what to do, Servant leadership, as Frank talks about leadership, being a servant leader, where you say, what does it look like for you? What do you need from me? And I think that the best leaders do that. And then their staff takes care of them and and, and jumps aboard and helps them with new initiatives. And, and it's a team. You know, it's absolutely a team. So I would say the culture had to be uh, a strong team. And, and that makes the, all the difference. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. I'm going to switch gears a little bit, but I think it has a lot to do with school culture also and some of the things that you were talking about. But, you know, right now across the country, we're dealing with the teacher shortage. And I don't know about the two of you, but I... I believe that this is only going to get worse before it gets better. And so I know there's several things that you believe are part of this problem that we're currently dealing with, but I also know that some of the the pieces of that is making sure that our new teachers are able to navigate their profession. So what are some things that you think our leaders should be doing to help assist our brand new teachers? For us, that was the impetus to write this book was how do we keep these young staff members, or maybe they're not young, maybe they're coming in as a second career, but how do we keep these new staff members in the classroom, not just keep them there, but keep them fired up, keep them excited about what they're doing. And really, there's uh, there's so many different things that we do need to do in order to do that. But I, I would say going back to that support, making sure that we are supporting them in every way possible that we're guiding them, we're giving them the professional development that they need, that we are giving them the mentors that really will make a difference for them, not just people that sign up and say, yeah, I'll I'll be a mentor for the $600 for the year, but people who want to mentor them in ways that that impact them meaningfully. We also have to give them the respect that, that, that they're educators and professionals and We need to take some of the things off their plate instead of keep putting more things on their plate. So there's a plethora of things that we need to do for people just entering the profession. Because as we pointed out that um, this massive teacher shortage, the looming teacher shortage that we have and will be upon us before you know it, part of it is we're not attracting people into the profession. We are not supporting the ones that are there enough that they want to leave within the first five years, 50% want to leave within the first five years. And then the third is, is that our veteran educators are leaving as soon as they possibly can. So we need to do a better job. And that was one of the reasons why we wrote the book. And we have tons of ideas on how we can help them navigate this profession and help we, how we can support them just to follow up with that is that no one wants to live a life of isolation and teachers that feel supported are more likely to have the longevity teachers that don't feel that feel they can get the professional development and, and sometimes it's not easy because it's this is the budget so spend it here or spend it there and that's why that mentorship is so important and there are so many informal mentors as well as formal mentors so if you decide we're all in this together look re- remember how you want to feel you want to live that life of importance and we can live that life of importance if we all feel a certain way and that climate and culture and the relationship building is, is really important when I first became a principal and uh, one of my goals was to get in every room every day. And I, we had a school that was small enough for me to do that. It was about 550 students when I started. So I, I could do that and I could learn the names of every kid. And I could, obviously, the people that worked there felt supported. And they knew I wasn't just showing up when something was wrong. I wasn't just showing up to do an observation. I wasn't just showing up to catch you doing the wrong thing, but I'm showing up 
to catch you doing the right thing. And sometimes that right thing is right for both of us. We're both learning and a little gratitude goes a long way. What's the number one thing that you could do? Be grateful <laughs> and allow the people around you to, to know that you are grateful. And sometimes uh, it's just that simple. And, and most of the time it's not, but uh, it's, a, it's a start. Michelle, you talked about the veteran teachers leaving at a rapid pace. And I know in the book, you all talk about staying passionate within your career, but not a short career, but one that's long and vast. So what are some things that our teachers or our leaders can do to make sure that that passion stays with them for a long career? You know, it's one of the things that when you compare a brand new staff member, a brand new teacher to one that has been there a really long time, there are things that they both need that are similar. They, they both need to be treated with dignity and respect. They need to be valued, you know, know, need to know that you appreciate what they do. But the difference with a veteran teacher a lot of times is that they need some autonomy. I, I often laugh when a new administrator comes into a building and the veteran teacher has seen maybe three or four administrators change, that veteran teacher could probably teach the job of being an administrator to the new administrator. And too often the new administrator comes in thinking, well, I'm in charge, I'm supposed to do this and I need to take control and I need to change things. And so I always think to myself, if you have veteran teachers who are really passionate about what they do, give them the autonomy to do that. Give them some latitude so that they can share all of the things that they have learned over the years with you and with the students. And I think that goes a really long way is giving them that autonomy and also bringing them in close, you know, look at them and give them that ultimate respect by saying, Hey, I'm the new guy here. I'm the new, new girl here. And I need you to help me because I don't know this culture and I don't know these students and what would you recommend? And, and I think most of the time that's what they're looking for is somebody who's, who wants to bring them in as part of their team and wants to give them the autonomy that they need and they don't want to be micromanaged. That's probably the biggest issue that a veteran teacher has that, uh, you know, I have lesson plans I have to do and, and they're nagging me about these lesson plans, but I've been teaching for 25 years, you know, so anytime we can give them more autonomy, I think is, is a plus plus for the veteran teachers. And then the overall culture, you know, when, when you come to work every day and you love where you work and you love your colleagues and you feel supported by your administrators, then I don't think you're looking for the door. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Frank? What do you think uh, helps keep our teachers and our educators passionate for long into their career? Uh, one thing that, that I always preach is balance and uh, that balance, not only in yourself, body, mind, heart, spirit, but in your life. Uh, Stephen Covey has a quote that, and I'm paraphrasing it, uh, success at work doesn't make up for failure at home, you know, and vice versa. So it's, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a balance. And I used to, and I, I still tell people, hey, look, when you're at, at work, be at work. And when you're at home, be at home. And that's the only way that you can have longevity because you go through these cycles of, hey, look, uh, y young teacher gets married, has family, becomes uh, an older teacher, but it's it's life. So, you know, you, you, you don't penalize somebody for uh, having passions outside of the school building because they will also bring their passions inside the school bu building whatever it is, maybe it's knitting, maybe it's sports, maybe it's uh, tech, uh, you know, maybe it's physical fitness, but it's something that you could plug in to make your building, your school, your community run better. So l l let's go with it. And if it's, if it's encouraged and uh, if people encourage you and you feel that reciprocation, then amazing things uh, can happen. And uh, one of the things I did in the beginning, wh when I first became a principal, is I asked, hey, what are some things that, that, that we're looking for in the culture, in the climate, in moving forward in, in a teacher tool type of way? So we found things that worked. What works for me doesn't work for you, et cetera, et cetera. What works best for the students? And that's where we need to be. And, so, and that's where we were. 
and when you plug that into the community and when parents know that you want the same thing as they want, you want their children to be successful, then you have a valuable, another valuable member of your team and another valuable member of leadership. Take you back off of uh, Frank's part about balance. And, and I think that that was so spot on in terms of that. And it kind of triggered the, in my mind that I would, had been thinking about this. One of the things that we tend to do is we tend to overuse certain people in the building. So our go-to people, we, we, and I don't want to use the word use, but we utilize them or ask them to volunteer in ways that help the cause, help the overall you know, school culture and all of the things that go into a school day. And they're willing to do that because they really do what, what's best for kids. But I think that as they move into that more veteran stage, that's another thing that kind of burns them out is, is that when they are overloaded with the too many, you know, requests to volunteer. So I think that would be one of the things suggestions I would have to keep them in a little bit longer to keep them fired up is let them explore some of the things that they're passionate about and, and drive their own professional development and don't overutilize them or, or ask them to volunteer so much that they don't have the opportunity to improve their craft and, and pedagogy because they're so bogged down with all of the other you know, roles and responsibilities that they have in a school. So I don't know who wants to take this on, but we've we've touched on your new book, Fired Up Teachership. But for anyone that hasn't had an opportunity to read this awesome book, will one of you just provide a, a quick synopsis of the text? So Fired Up Teachership is exactly what, what we call a playbook, maybe, or a primer on how people can stay passionate long into their career. And it has... I refer to it as, you know, when they talk about hacking the profession, like the the magic codes or the magic keys on how you're able to navigate through all of the professional obligations you have as a teacher without losing your, your passion, without losing the energy that you have for what you do every day. And so some of the things that we talk about in the book are, you know, obviously what is your why? I mean, that's huge. Uh, Just knowing what your why is, why are you there? And reminding yourself about that. And then we also talk about who's in your circle. Who do you surround yourself with? You know, we're the product of the five people that we spend the most time with. So that's pretty important when you think about that in terms of a school. We talk about building relationships with students, with colleagues, with the community at large and the families. So that's really, relationships is probably the one thing that Frank and I say every time we meet for any reason, uh, we talk about relationships because it's the foundation of everything. And then just, there is a section where we talk about procedures and classroom leadership so that people that may struggle with how are I'm going to get, how am I going to get all of this done and how am I going to maintain order so that every student can learn those things. We, we spend a little bit of time on that. And then we really end with like, um, what's your legacy? And so I call it backwards planning, you know, like understanding by design where you start with the end in mind and then you kind of come back to it. If you know what you want your legacy to be as an educator, then everything that you do should lead up to that. And that should be your constant, I guess, North Star in terms of what you do. So if you want, as Frank refers to it as, how are are they talking about you at the dinner table? How are people talking about you at the dinner table? If you want them to say, oh my gosh, that guy, he's amazing. He has such energy and he knows every student's name and he is such an incredible present principal If you're not doing those things, that's not going to be your legacy. So for us, you know, that was where we ended it with what do you want to be remembered as and how do you want, and not just in your professional career, but personally as well. Start with the end in mind and and work your way back and every year, just recommit yourself. Remember what your why is and what your legacy will be. And I think it'll keep you going in the right direction. And I think it'll reinvigorate you year after year. As you both know, I love asking this question at the end for my guests about actionable items. So 
it's one thing to hear all this amazing knowledge, but it's another to actually go out and do these things to enhance our leadership journey. So if someone can do something tomorrow or next week to enhance their leadership skills, what is one thing they can do? And I'll start with you, Frank. I mean, I just thought of this off the top of my head. It's in one of the other books I wrote, but it's uh, talk to someone you would never talk to. Think, think about that, whether it's a student, whether it's a custodian, whether it's an administrator, and it'll surprise the heck out of them. And when I did it for the first time, and that was one of the things I did every, every single day is I, I made sure I talked to people and uh, it, it they, they look at you legitimately like you're out of your mind uh, because they never expected you to come up and talk to them and ask and ask their opinion on anything. But if you want to know what a student wants, ask a student. If you live your life that way, then uh, you will live a life of leadership and a life of living a life of leadership is uh, living a life worth living. What about you, Michelle? What do you think is one actionable item for our listeners? Well, I'm hoping that our our listeners will go out tomorrow and it doesn't matter whether they're in a leadership role or they're in, which we shouldn't say that, they're in a leadership as in terms of administrator or their leadership as a teacher. They should seek out the new staff and ask them how they can take something off their plate. And that would go a long way for the young staff. You know, I, I would always say, what are you struggling with? What is causing you the most anxiety? What are you spending most of the time on? Yeah. And when you ask a couple of those questions and you say, let me take something off your plate, they would say to me, oh, I have lesson plans and I have to cut these things out for the kids. Well, let me take that off your plate. Let me. So anytime you can take something off their plate um, so that they can spend a little bit more time on things that and have less anxiety, I think is a win win. And it's building that relationship. Yeah. And like you said earlier, the the servanthood piece of, of leadership. So now we talked about connecting and, and finding a mentor. I know both of you do a marvelous job of, of doing both those things. So for the listeners, if they want to connect with you on social media, how may they do that? Well, um, my, my Twitter handle and Instagram is Dr. Frank Rudd, D-R Frank R-U-D. And if you contact me, I promise I will contact you back. <laughs> Easiest way to get a hold of me is Twitter. It is Hill M. Rispo. Um, I'm also on Instagram, M. Rispo Hill, and Michelle Rispo on Facebook. Um, and I we do have a uh, firedupteachership.com webpage that you can find the book and more information there as well. Yes, definitely reach out to both Frank and Michelle. Like Frank said, they'll they'll make sure that they reach back out and, and help in any way they possibly can. And those aren't empty words. So make sure that you're finding them on social media. Check out their amazing book, Fired Up Teachership, and jump on their website. Find more resources by both of them. And Michelle, Frank, thank you so much for being on this Fire Podcast. It was such a joy to speak with you tonight. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Peace and love always win. Thanks so much. This was a great treat. Awesome way to end of the day.